that. So I'm gonna go ahead and start the meeting here. We will call the meeting to order. And um, we begin with the roll call. Certainly, uh, Member Jurch. Here. Member Weebolt. Here. Member Miner. Here. Member Nickel. Here. Chair Bergman. Here. We have a quorum. Great. Well, thank you all for being here. I want to thank the audience for being here this evening. Uh, first thing on our agenda, agenda is to uh, take a look at the minutes. And so that's the pink document in our package. I hope everybody's had a chance to take a look at it. Are there any changes recommended to this? If we don't have any changes or recommendations, can I get a motion to uh, adopt the minutes? So moved. Seconded. And a second. We have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, great. Uh, we get to item three, non-agenda items and visitors. We set aside 15 minutes at this time for people who would like to address the audience. Um, I don't know that we have anybody in the audience to address us this evening. Do we have anybody online to uh, speak to us? Let's take a look here. Uh, so yeah, we do have one per person participating virtually. They have not asked to um, be recognized. Oh, okay. All right. Well, great. All right. Well, um, thank you to everybody. We'll move on to item four, the demolition review of one Moffat Road. Uh, so to begin with, um, can we have someone from the, uh, the owner or the architect come and give us uh, a, a brief overview of this? My name is Tim Archibald, and I'm an architect for Midwest Architecture Studio in Lake Forest. And my partner is uh, Brian Bertola. And uh, the eight Hearns, Ted and Katie, are the homeowners. And Ross Friedman uh, is the project manager, overall project manager for the project <coughs> for the eight Hearns. And so that's kind of our project team at this point. Great. Um, I'd like to, we have a site plan up. Uh, and I can just show you, this is the waterfront property, and then here is the smaller uh, open zero Cambridge uh, property, and then this is the Ahern's current house, 525 Cambridge, just to kind of locate you. And I think before I talk a bit about the home and the approach of the Aherns. Um, I think it would be nice for them to introduce themselves to you. Okay, great. Yeah, sure, come on. All right. Uh, hi, uh, I'm Ted Ahern. This is my wife, Katie. Um, th first of all, thank you for you know taking some time out tonight to uh, uh, listen to us. Uh, or we can chat about uh, One Moffat. Um, you know, Katie and I have lived in Lake Bluff for uh, close to 30 years. We bought our first house over on Mallman, two bedroom, in 1993, and uh, have loved living here ever since. We raised our kids here. Um, we've uh, have just made countless memories, and uh, can't imagine living anywhere else. And uh, our goal, our hope, and knock on wood, is to you know spend the rest of our lives here. So, when when Moffat came uh, came up, uh, it was you know very exciting, uh, uh, you know. Um, Opportunity, opportunity and uh, uh, something that, you know, a, a, pro a property that we've admired, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, you know, from afar next door for the last, you know, three or four years. And uh, we didn't want to see it, you know, get subdivided and, uh, you know, multiple homes put in that would change the nature of the neighborhood. So, uh, you know, we're very excited to start this new chapter uh, in Lake Bluff. And uh, our, our goal for the property is to, uh, Tim could get into some more detail later on in, in terms of, you know, pres preserving certain facets of the existing uh, uh, property. But our, our long-term goal is to uh, keep it very open space, build a smaller house um, that's uh, very eco-friendly and, uh, you know, just complements uh, the beautiful piece of land. And uh, so that's really our goal. And, uh, you, know, have, you know, thanks again for, uh, you know, meeting with us and chatting with us about it tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so in the demolition application, there is a longer um, history and information, and I'll just kind of uh, give a summary of that here for people in the audience and online. So um, this is the original uh, footprint of the building, um, and 
operate the pointer. Uh, we just come in from, there it is, this direction. And this is the main entry. Um, and the great room wing, service wing, library. This was the original garage. And then the lake is. And there have been uh, a number of additions done over the years. Glenn, I'm not getting a. <laughs> there it is. Oh, hope I didn't go too far. OK. Um, so in the early 1930s, uh, a, a little bit off the property, uh, the William H. Ferry estate sold an 18-acre parcel to Conway and Elizabeth Olmsted within the Ferry Field and Ferry Woods subdivision. That went all the way back to Sheridan Road, as I understand. And after various land configuration changes to the original property, there remains today a 4.65-acre parcel known as One Moffat Road, which the house, current house sits on and a 2.3 acre parcel known as Zero Cambridge Lane, which is between the Aherns and the lakefront property. Uh, the Conway, Conway Olmsted house was designed from 1936 to 1937, as best as I can tell, in the French eclectic style by New York City architects Stellano and Aldrich, who are uh, well-known architects, um, especially East Coast, but around the country for uh, estate homes, institutional projects, and they, between 1900 and 1940, were very prominent um, New York City uh, architects uh, for, um, for very wealthy institutions and people. Stanley Anderson has also been connected to the project as the local architect or supervising architect. And the home has uh, notable owners since Conway and Elizabeth Olmsted, including Sarah Bartholomew, Phelps Swift, the Eck family, most recently John and Carol Sandner, and now the Aherns um, as of this year. So multiple alterations and additions to the home have occurred since the original construction in the late 1930s. And those include Herman Lackner's pool addition in 1945, and that is here, pool and, and two pavilion pieces to the south. Uh, Walter Frazier's 1964 addition to the north, and that is this addition here. And uh, Lake Effect Architects east side additions and north side garage replacement between 2006 and 2008, and that's the sunroom filling in of a summer porch, uh, this link piece and the four car garage. So pretty substantial changes uh, to the exterior since the original. And the interior of the home has been renovated uh, multiple times uh, in all but a few of the spaces. Those spaces that have not been altered as much are the great room, the library, and the entry and stair area. <coughs> uh, and the renovated spaces that have um, seen that work are kind of unremarkable. Um, and we'll see pictures of that, and you've toured that this week. Uh, the current structure has been altered to such a degree that the home lacks historic design integrity in exterior composition, except, I would say, for the front entry court elevation, and in most of the interior spaces, except for those just mentioned. For these reasons, we believe the current home would not be a candidate for designation, designation as a village historic landmark. So let me just quickly for the benefit of others, go through approach to the home, garage and kind of coming around towards the water, the water side, and you can see the two white additions are the uh, lake effect changes uh, in the last 20 years. This is the pool. Uh, and west side of the home, and you can kind of see the great room behind the tree, and then a collection of interiors, pictures. I'm trying with the pictures to give a mix of what's there, both um, renovated and, and less renovated. That's the great room. <clears throat> uh, 
And then as you get upstairs into the third floor, it's um, pretty basic. Okay, so um, the home today. One Moffat Road was designed as a period country estate, uh, and there are many reminders uh, t uh, that make the home less attractive for today's modern living. Foremost is the scale of the home. The interior space is over 14,000 square feet with nine bedrooms and 14 bathrooms. The thermal qualities of the home are poor given the materials and the age. And coupled with the volume of conditioned spaces, there is a tremendous energy consumption for most of the year. Importantly, the original home does not engage the lake and the views the way waterfront homes today emphasize these spectacular features. One Moffat Road was designed more about the approach as a pastoral estate through the landscape all the way from Sheridan Road and less about the Lake Michigan waterfront. The original garage was even placed between the home and the water and you blocked kind of half the view of the lake with where that garage originally was. And one can see over the decades, decades how owners um, have minimized their efforts on the uh, Western approach side. They've kind of let things go on that side and tr tried desperately to get kind of closer to the water because the house, and not just closer, but, but with more engagement and more views. Finally, if the home were to be returned to its original historic design, that means removing additions, replacing windows, doors, and the slate roof, gutting the interior to insulate and refinish it, replace all the mechanical equipment, the result would be a very handsome, historic 10,000 square foot mansion, but uh, there would be tremendous operating costs, a poor relationship to the site, and all of this would be a greater cost than building a new home. The rehabilitation option is unappealing to almost all buyers in the modern market, and is why the home and many like it sit on the market for years, sometimes decades. So the proposed project, <clears throat> The tremendous scale, energy use, and dated site response of the existing home are counter to the Ahern's primary goals in developing the waterfront property as their permanent lifetime home. Although the Ahern's are not choosing to renovate the existing structure, their project vision incorporates many components and materials of the existing home. Most notably, they would like to repurpose the well-preserved, the most well-preserved volume of the home, the great room, and relocated on the property as a bluff pavilion, largely intact. And so that is this piece, sorry. So we can go back. The great room piece. Yeah. Trying to go all the way back to uh, the photo. Uh, no, just to uh, just to the no, just to the the site plan. The, I think it's the next to the last slide. There, yes. So where it says proposed building re, uh, repurposing, that's the great room piece, and relocating that closer to the bluff as a uh, as a bluff pavilion within allowable setbacks, and then um, the rest of the home uh, would be recycled. Um, uh, and that involves a kind of piece by piece, uh, literally every brick, every piece of slate, um, all windows and doors, every interior component is methodically um, uh, removed, palleted, uh, placed into a, a place that it can be shipped, and then uh, donated, and, uh, and it's used in other projects, so it's truly recycled that we haven't gotten far enough in the design to know this for sure yet, but certainly the Chicago common brick and the slate uh, roof are um, materials that the Ahrens are interested in using uh, and uh, on their new home. And then the windows and doors, which are steel, single pane, um, very uh, you know, beautiful old windows and doors, We'd like to see if we can use those in a greenhouse um, type structure. So those are all things we'd like to try to do. Uh, but it's not, it's not backing up dump trucks and knocking it down and, and you know, smoothing it over. That's not the approach that's being taken. Um, okay, 
uh, in addition to the existing library interior, we would like to uh, try to preserve in another space in the new home. Um, an important driving principle for the project is environmental consciousness. This approach will be present in the architecture, a smaller scale footprint, investing in low energy products, sustainable design features, and also in the landscape design with native natural landscape and uh, uh, capture and recycle natural resources. The Ahern's intent is to execute a plat of resubdivision for the zero Cambridge lot property, which is between the front and their home. Um, and, um, and that would help remedy any existing zoning irregularities, but also importantly forever render it uh, unbuildable. And um, Ted kind of spoke to that as, as what that means to the neighborhood. An important part of the project for the Aherns is restoring aspects of the combined seven acre parcel that are in need of investment. This includes removing the tennis court, the fence, various shed outbuildings and other site and landscape components that have fallen into disrepair and are not part of the future plan. An arborist has been engaged to do a complete tree survey and once captured, we'll start work on removing unhealthy trees, plants tra transplanting trees and conducting tree maintenance. A bluff analysis has been completed to start the process of restoring the long-term health of the bluff and beach, improving access and replacing structures and disrepair. Likewise, the Southern Ravine is in need of maintenance and repair. The Aherns will engage a landscape design firm to collaborate with the project team and hope to start executing a native plant landscape design very soon. So that's kind of, that's their vision. Their vision for One Moffat Road is environmentally progressive and honors many aspects of the existing period home and site despite the request for partial demolition. With thoughtful analysis, the conclusion has been reached that the existing home is historically compromised, embedded in an outdated era for modern living, unresponsive to the breathtaking site, consumes tremendous resources, and is not compatible with their vision of a responsive house in a natural landscape. We respectfully ask that the commission approve the request for demolition to allow the Aherns to proceed with house design and construction and site restoration. There is important sequencing work for this project and a delay in demolition approval causes delays in all aspects of the project, naturally. In some cases, the delay may compromise worthy goals for the project and for the site. Things like bluff and ravine restoration, uh, preserving parts of the existing structure, recycling efforts, landscape restoration, these things all are additive time things. So when you're adding time on top of time, it's difficult. We feel that these are valuable goals of the project for the neighborhood and for the Lake Buff community, and we ask the commission to consider these efforts in your decision. Thank you for your commitment to Lake Bluff and for your personal time on this important commission. I know it's, um, it takes a lot of time and we do appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Archibald. Uh, uh, nice presentation. Um, I will go just I forgot my last slide, I'm sorry, oh, which good. is a part of the package, but um, you can see moving from left to right is the Ahern's existing house, and then a very high level proposal of uh, coming through a more natural landscape, <coughs> repositioning the driveway, um, the, and having a smaller scale home uh, that has a closer relationship to the views on the site, uh, garden, and uh, beach pavilion and pickleball court with a view. <laughs> Thank uh, you. Great. Okay. Um, I'm going to ask all the members if they have any questions, but I have one question first. Is you were talking about the energy consumption of the building. Um, what's the condition, the current condition of the heating and ventilating units in the in the building? Is that all? Okay. Hope you can come up to the podium. So it's a mix. We haven't done a full inventory, so it's more kind of based on observation. Um, uh, there's both uh, hot water heat, uh, forced hot air heat, and forced cold air cooling. Um, some of the boilers uh, appear to be newer. Some in the remote, more remote locations in the house are either unknown or, or appear old. Um, 
same with the air handlers. Uh, um, but none of them, they're all old enough that they're not uh, the kind of higher energy efficient models uh, or maybe even the type of energy we want to use. So um, the Aherns are very interested in solar energy in geothermal uh, wells for, to uh, heat and cool and other things that, are, that may or may not work with existing. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, um, okay, so um, do we have any, does any uh, of our members here have questions? Any uh, further information that you'd like to hear from uh, Mr. Archibald? Do you? Yes. Yeah, um, hi, I um, toured the home yesterday and it was really enlightening to go in and see it. Um, can I first say that it's really refreshing um, from our perspective and from the perspective of any Lake Bluffer, I think, to see someone who is not chasing developer dollars. <laughs> I, I really commend you for, for that approach because as you said, I, I, would, I would think there'd be developers drooling over that and even, um, you know, God knows what would happen in there. So um, thank you for that. Um, I, I was wondering if you were planning on removing the pool and the structures, and it looks like that is the case in your new proposal. Is that the case? Yes. It is, although yes. um, that, certainly the pool. Uh, it's uh, still a kind of question whether or not there'd be a pool in, uh, as part of the new home, so mm -hmm. that's still uh, kind of thinking through that, the, the Aherns are. Um, but the two uh, changing structures, I think, are really kind of interesting, and I could see I could see uh, finding a place for those on the property. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Um, and as far as what you're planning to do with the, the the plot between your current home and and this home, I was curious if you were going to put that into some kind of conservancy. You were talking about it wanting wanting to make sure it would never be built upon. So. I talked um, a, just a bit with the Aherns about that and with uh, Glenn Cole. And um, so it would either be uh, a plat of resubdivision, which would effectively not allow it to be built on in the future um, because you would add the land to each of the two adjacent properties mm -hmm. uh, or go into conservancy as part of that plat of resubdivision and find um, someone to accept it in that way. Um, and they haven't reached a decision on the limitations of doing that and the benefits of doing that. Okay. Either way, it's not built on, and that's their main goal. Great, great. Um, and I know that you <clears throat> haven't gotten real far on the planning of the new home yet, according to what we, we were talking about yesterday, but I'm curious as to what kind of square footage you're looking to. So uh, still, not entirely known, but uh, in the range of 5,000 square feet. Okay, so considerably smaller. Considerably. And, and are you looking yeah. at something one level? Or? No, not necessarily. St uh, again, still, we haven't even gotten there, but um, one uh, or two levels. And um, I think the, the, the driving principle right now is, uh, is kind of how does it relate to landscape and uh, view and site? and approach and then the number of levels and location of spaces kind of comes out of that. Okay, all right, all right. Well, um, good luck to you. I know with, with saving the bluff, you, you've got erosion, you know, potential erosion on both sides there with the ravine and with the lakefront. And I know you're going to be um, sinking a lot of time and energy and tender loving dollars, as Paul always says, <laughs> in, into that. And, you know, God love you for, for doing it. So thank you. Open it to everybody else. Uh, so good. Uh, Member Liebelt, you have some questions? No comment now? at this time. No? Okay. All right. Uh, uh, Member Minor, Margaret? I didn't have the benefit of walking through it, but I did watch the video of the tour that happened this week. Um, I think the the, the building itself is absolutely beautiful as you enter it, like you um, drive up to it. 
but my impression is that it's kind of functionally obsolete at this point, the way it's had so many additions to it. Um, to your point about scale, it doesn't really represent today's lifestyles. Um, the Ahearns have lived here for so many years, and it seems like every property that they touch um, is better off as a result of their uh, tenure. Um, so I am excited to see what happens. Um, but at this point, I don't have any additional questions or comments. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, Member Nickel? Thank you, Lois? Um, I, too, toured it. And thank you very much for that. That was very informative and very helpful. And um, I love going through it. Um, it's a beautiful uh, facade. And it was just beautiful driving up to it and seeing the um, classical French architecture. Um, and, and then it is, of course, as when you walk into the home, it's very different than the outside. Mm -hmm. I was struck by how how um, sound the structure seems mm -hmm. to be. Um, the walls, the windows are just like uh, in great shape. It, I know clearly the people who have lived there maintained it well. Um, and it is um, the warren of rooms inside. You know, and I thought that was very interesting that the, the people who lived there before adapted the inside to their living. You said they had 10 children, and so they had a lot of rooms to uh, support all those children. And they were able to do it without destroying the front facade. They mm -hmm. There were those provisions in that. My question is um, how much um, time and, and energy was spent on looking at how could um, the current family adapt the inside to modern living, as you say. I know that it's a lot of energy drain, and I fully applaud all of the work to be sustainable. Mm -hmm. I think it's wonderful. Um, but it, is it possible to, to adapt the inside, the rooms within that beautiful structure to meet modern living needs? So it is. Um, and I, I, we did, we talked about that as a team and, and went through, okay, what would that look like? The first, that's the first thing we did and said, what if, if we peeled back the additions that aren't contributing to the beauty of the house. Um, and then we, okay, we, we need to remove about two thirds of the slate and replace it. And we need to replace all the windows and doors. And then we need to go through the entire three floors and take everything down to studs so that we can insulate and rewire and replumb. Sure. Um, and then we put it all back together, and we have a and we have a modern interior, mm -hmm. um, and we have a beautiful facade, and then a complementing uh, southeast north mm -hmm. sides, um, but it's more expensive, and it still doesn't have any. Um, it, it it still has a very compromised relationship to the to the lake, just based on where it's positioned and how it's positioned. Okay. And then um, the, the, the approach that, well, the approach is a little different, but, um, and so in the end, we felt like, okay, for that added cost, um, the Aherns end up with something they don't want, which is a huge house that consumes a lot of energy that doesn't have a great relationship to the site. And it's not something I think we all see this as not something that many people want, as beautiful as it is. And it would be beautiful. Um, so that's when we first started to kind of shift away from that. And we had these discussions um, before, uh, before the Aherns um, purchased the property. So it wasn't like it, they were stuck at the point of having those conversations. It was a very open-minded conversation. Um, Can I ask a question about that? Yes. What is the history of the property from a sales perspective? 
I saw that it was listed in the summer, but hadn't it been put on the market um, for years, off and on? I think, uh, I know the um, Zero Cambridge uh, plot had been on, on the market for a number of years. Um, and then, uh, yes, I think there has been, uh, the, it, it has been on and off. Mm -hmm. I don't know the specific history of it, mm -hmm. but, um, uh, but in general, it's actually, so over 90 years, it's had like now six, this is the sixth owners, or really five, I think five owners. Maybe, maybe four. So, so um, it hasn't tested the market very much. Mm -hmm. um, but I think a n number of houses like it have. Mm -hmm. okay. Good. Any other comments, thoughts? Glenn, do you have any comments? Uh, sure. So I, I guess maybe uh, if this is a good time, if the commission's ready to um, deliberate. I'm on the, I, don't, I don't believe we have anyone in the public so, wishes to. I, I should ask publicly, are there any, um, uh, any, anybody else in the audience, either online or else in the audience, who would like to make any comments? And um, I don't think there is anyone, but um, we offer that opportunity. So. Um, I don't know if there's no one um, seeking to do so online. Okay. So uh, as we transition, just a, a few, uh, I suppose, procedural notes. Um, so the first, as uh, members of the commission have, have said, um, we arranged um, for tours of one or two commissioners at a time uh, in order to, to comply with the Open Meetings Act of commissioners at the property. Um, we publicized that in a memorandum that was published yesterday um, on the website. Uh, there's copies of that supplemental packet um, there for you at the dais. Uh, we also shot one of those um, tours on video and that's posted publicly on the, the village's website as well. So any interested party could go and, and see um, you know, what one of you saw and what's very similar in substance to um, what all of you saw. That packet also contains some materials we were asked to circulate by members uh, of the commission. Um, so procedurally tonight, you have um, a few different questions to work through um, by motion. So again, the purpose of this review um, under the code is to determine um, if this property um, meets the requirements for landmark designation, and you have um, 90 days to do that in, right? So if you take nothing, do no action tonight, that clock ticks for 90 days, and on the 91st day, um, you know, the property owner can ask for and receive their uh, demolition permit. So the, the first question, and these don't necessarily have to be in order, is how you handle the review. Again, you can choose to let it expire. You can choose to um, uh, end it immediately if you feel there's no further need to discuss it. Um, that th those are really your choices there. Um, the second, relatedly, is that the village board can, can extend that period a little bit further. They can extend an additional 30 days to accomplish specific goals. And so you could choose to, to ask the board to consider uh, you know, extending that delay period, which would take you up to a total of 120 days. Uh, the last part is, as it says in, in the purpose, you know, the purpose of this is to consider a landmark designation. Um, strictly speaking, any one commissioner can, can trigger that process um, if the intent is that staff would prepare that on behalf of the commission. Um, we would ask for your direction by motion to do so. Um, we think it's uh, you know, important that a majority of the commission be directing us to, to undertake that. So those are really your two and a half, three questions to, to work through tonight. Great. Thank you. Um, I want to raise a question, do we think this building is landmarkable? Is it worthy of being a landmark? And in doing that, I want to go back and look at, since we're trying to be a rules-based organization, we want to go back to the guidelines that we have. I don't want to go through all 17 guidelines because it's not in front of us as a landmark proposition, but some of the general considerations are, um, does the feature involve the notable efforts or is the only known example of a work of a master builder, designer, or architect? So is this a work of a master architect? Under architectural considerations, um, uh, does, the, does the building embody elements of design, detail, material, or craftsmanship of exceptional quality? 
uh, it re represents distinguishing characteristics of architecture inherently invaluable for study of the time period involved. Um, historic significance would be uh, the feature is an exceptional example of a historic or vernacular style and is one of a uh, few such remaining properties of its kind in the village. So these are some of the questions that we have if we go through the landmarking process. And I want to ask us tonight if we think, does this building meet some of those standards? Does this building, is this building eminently landmarkable for the information that we've seen this evening? And so I'd like to have your comments on, on, on your thoughts on that. So, does anybody want to have a, a, a go with that? I'll start. Clearly, yes. Okay. Um, well-known architects, yes. The construction manager, well-known, yes. Um, there have been a lot of changes, but um, a lot of what we try to do with the HPC is... Um, concentrate on what's on the outside, not so much on what's on the inside, especially the front facade. Being that this building is, I, I don't think a lot of the front facade has been destroyed by the additions that are visible from the, from the west side of the house as you approach. Um, this, this is getting into a little bit of a sticky situation. I do feel that it's worthy of being landmarked, but I also, as long as we're open for discussion, I feel that the the request to do a teardown is is very valid in this case. Okay. So I, I I know that 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 has happened before that something has been landmarked and then torn down, and I mm -hmm. I used to be horrified by that. Um, but I think in this case it's appropriate. Okay. Um, thoughts on this side? Either Margaret, uh, your thoughts. I feel that um, the ownership of the property should be initiating the landmark request, and if they're not um, actively seeking that, okay. um, I agree that the building has merit, but I also um, feel strongly in um, property owner rights, and so I would, I, I feel that the request to tear it down is also reasonable. Okay. Um, member um, Nickel? I agree with what Member Church said about um, um, how it meets the different criteria for landmarking. So I think it, it is important for us to uh, look at that. And this commission is really uh, it charged with looking at um, those homes that um, are um, meet the criteria for landmarking and, and and to do careful consideration of how we want to proceed with that. Uh, you know, certainly I understand um, that um, Ahern family's request um, based on wanting to have um, a smaller footprint um, and how they want to incorporate a lot of sustainability uh, efforts in the new home. Yet I also um, believe that we need to look at this home that was uh, built by uh, world-class architects um, and is still in pristine condition as one of the last um, remaining in this area. So um, I would like to um, discuss it further and continue further. Okay. All right. Member Liebel, your thoughts? I think the building had its time, and in general, it's time to move on. Okay. All right. So uh, my initial question is, do we think it's landmarkable? And you all have sort of answered that, uh, and then added some more comments about where we think we should go. That's, that's the, the next question we get to, where do we think we should go this evening? Um, do we think that we want to spend some more time looking at the history of this building? Do we want to gather some more information about this? Um, 
my father's firm, Stanley Anderson, did a great deal of work on the property. Um, I don't know if that's of any interest to anybody. I haven't offered that information up yet, but um, so I don't know if we want to spend more time gathering more information about the property. Um, it doesn't sound like there's a great deal of interest in going ahead and landmarking the property and then asking the Aherns to run out the clock and then apply for the demolition derm permit. Um, but what would we like to do this evening? I'll, I'll mention okay. here if we're looking at the, the short end, you know, there's still other administrative requirements, um, you know, uh, of, of the village's building code that would need to be met before a, a teardown could mm -hmm. start. Um, so, you know, intentionally the code is written to not require those things to be done before you're starting a conversation with the landowner. But in this case, I think it would be difficult to, you know, it would require civil engineering work and preparation of demolition site management plan, so on, so on. Um, I think it would be difficult as a, a practical matter to get that going. I, I, I suppose you could start before Christmas, but I mean, you're, you know, you're probably talking about mm -hmm. January either way. I, I defer to uh, Mr. Archibald on that, but. Yeah, so there's, yeah, there's a number of things there. An arborist report, we need to have a site um, a safety plan with fencing and tree protection and other things like that. So there's a, there are things that take a little time to even to get into position to do demo. And this isn't a typical demo. So this is recycling. Um, and that's a, you know, uh, <coughs> three to six month process to do that. Uh, whereas demolition is, for a house like this, is a week, you know. Um, so um, <clears throat> so it, it really does help the Ahearns achieve other sequencing goals on the property to uh, a lot of things kind of wait till that happens and then come from there, including uh, landscape, bluff, uh, ravine, and other work, um, and, and preserving the great room. If we can do that, that, would, uh, that has to obviously wait until demo because that's the last thing that happens. Everything else gets deconstructed, and then you lift it up and, and move it, put it on a new foundation. All of that takes time. So long answer, I think... Um, there, is t there are a number of things to happen. We'd love to start those as soon as possible, knowing that we could um, actually start doing, tell people when they could start doing demolition or re recycling. All right, thank you. Um, I'd, I'd like to learn more about the plans for the property. Um, in my Stanley Anderson plans, there's a whole series of of work done to uh, shore up the shoreline. Now, I know in the 1970s, uh, a kid I went to high school with, his family owned the okay. Eck family, yeah. and they had a tremendous amount of activity in trying to shore up the bluff side of the property. Um, so uh, what's gonna happen to the bluff side of the property? What happens to the ravine side of the property? This property is sort of at risk on two different sides because of the ravine on one side, the erosion in the ravine on one side and the erosion on the lake on the other side. Um, I'm concerned about um, sort of the plans for the property of what goes in. If you're going to maintain the great room uh, as a, essentially a, a, a little pied de terre, a little party house uh, kind of thing, um, that seems to set an architectural style that sort of dictates what the rest of the property is going to look like. And yep. so I'm a little curious how that functions. Um, and then I'm also curious about the landscaping on the zero Moffat lot as well as on the, uh, on the larger lot. How does all of that come together? So, I, so let me start with the uh, bluff. So we've hired AECOM to do an initial report. Um, we've uh, the team met with them, talked through uh, that they're, with bluffs, nothing is 100% certain until it's actually failing, and then it's 100% certain. Um, so that's not the case right now, but uh, there are um, supports at the bottom, uh, the breakwaters, and the steepness of the slope, the vegetation. Some of it's operating effectively. Some of it looks like it's towards its last third of life. So. <coughs> The Aherns know they're going to need to do things to stabilize the bluff, 
Um, they don't want to be right at the edge of the setback of the bluff if the house is, is back from that. But um, that's a priority, is making that the long-term health of the bluff. Right now, AECOM is putting together a proposal for uh, actual work um, to do that so that the errands can know the cost and then sequence the priority of those things. But it's a high priority for them. Um, the ravine has been a little mismanaged over time, needs to be cleaned out, but it generally is a pretty healthy ravine. It has a good drainage, it has a concrete base, it's, um, it's pretty good, so it, so it, but it needs some kind of uh, cleaning up. And, um, mm -hmm. uh, and it's a beautiful ravine, and then the cemetery is right there. Uh, the landscape coming through, if you could imagine a more natural kind of prairie taller grass, natural grass landscape, the driveway bends to the right, and then comes back to the left in front of the house. Um, and it's very, it's not as structured, it's more natural. And then as you get closer to the house, the uh, what becomes more formal are gardens, not, not um, so vegetable gardens and other types of gardens. Uh, these are the interests of the Aherns. So, um, so it's a pretty uh, natural informal landscape that comes to a house that doesn't dominate that. That's uh, the scale of which is, is appropriate. Okay. And lots of views to the lake kind of coming and going. So those were three things. You had a fourth thing, and I forget what it was. Um, that's fine. So you talked about one Moffat. You talked about then the, pro the landscaping on both of the properties. You talked about the bluffs, um, both the lake bluff and, and the ravine bluff. Yeah. Um, and, um, and so I'm sort of wondering if you're going to so th there's parts of the house that you want to keep. So if you take the great room and put it out on the edge of the bluff, it right. seems that you now have this uh, French eclectic, French Norman um, uh, pied de terre that's out there. Yep. And how does that affect and how does that dominate the house architecture? Um, then the pickleball court goes in and then the um, greenhouse is a possibility. Yep. I don't know yep. how that's going to function. At, Right. So it's a great question. I think the answer is different for every architect. Um, uh, for me, once that uh, great room becomes a freestanding structure, it's a very simple gabled volume. And it's, uh, it comes a little bit out of uh, eclectic uh, French architecture design. And even though it still has the steep roofs and some of the, the soft curve at the end and other, other elements, um, it's a it's a more pure volume, and so it it can relate better to um, to another architecture that isn't the same. Uh, I think the Aherns don't want a, a strikingly modern house. They don't want a strikingly traditional house. It's going to be somewhere in between. It's kind of linear. The concept is that it's not frontal to the lake, where it's a very formal kind of frontal views, but oblique views where you're getting kind of corner views from every room and from every location. Um, so we're just going through all that thought, but um, I, feel, I feel really excited that there's an amazing solution with it and, and that we'll get to it. I don't know exactly what it is. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. Um, okay. Any other comments? Any thoughts? Um, what would you like to do? I think we should take a vote. On what? You have three options here. So the first option is the approval to terminate. The second option is to continue with no further discussion. And the third is to continue with further discussion, that is gathering more information and having more discussion at, in December on what we, what we have learned about the property and where that guides us forward from there. And so uh, I'm, I would... I have my own feelings about this, but I'm, I'm, I want to ask all of you first to um, offer up your um, um, thoughts or your, your, your positions on the various motions here. So. Well, um, I'm, I am always interested in learning as much there, as there is to learn about the history of a property and so on and so forth, but I, I feel like anything that we learn that we have not already seen is not going to change my mind a whole lot. You know, I'd like to see the outcome of this. Um, 
I, I take um, Member Miner's um, caveat about letting the owners pursue a uh, the, the petition to landmark the property, and um, I, I would like to see that happen because um, it, it was a very significant structure at one time, and, and, and in many ways still is. I would like to see that recognized formally, but I, I don't want to see that um, put up any kind of a, a blockage to what you propose to do, because I think that uh, my, my opinion is that what you're proposing is going to be a, a good thing for the property and for the village. I suggest that we uh, terminate the review and go ahead with the demolition. Okay. Margaret? I would second that. You would second that? Lois? Um, I would like to uh, continue um, at least until next month to see if there is any other information that we can gather about the home and just have time to um, investigate a little bit further. Mm -hmm. Okay. I would like to take some more time to, to, to look at this. I don't know that I'm ready to terminate the review tonight. I think there's uh, always the possibility of garnering some more information um, this is a huge house. It's a huge piece of property. It's a really significant house. I brought my Penoyer book in tonight <laughs> for, the, uh, for everybody to take a look at. Um, I don't know that I'm ready to say uh, goodbye to this property just yet. I think I would like to take a little bit more time to take a little, a little, a little um, sort of a second look. In 30 days, your plans are going to have matured and shaken out a little bit. You'll have more information about uh, what your thoughts are and what the condition of the property is and whatnot. So um, my thought is to um, ask for a continuation uh, until next meeting. And so um, those are my thoughts on this. Um, I, it's, this is, um, there's only so many really magnificent houses in Lake Bluff, and this is one of them. And uh, so I think we need to tread very carefully by, by just simply saying, oh, it's okay. It's, it's reached its um, functional, uh, the end of its functional life. Um, there's other houses that we have in Lake Bluff that have reached the end of their functional life. And it's very difficult to try and preserve one of those. But this house is still in good shape. There's still um, a lot of architectural details here that I think are very significant. So I would... Uh, ask all of you if you'd like to put this over for uh, 30 days over to the next meeting. Jim and Berg, I would. Okay. I'd be comfortable doing that. Okay. So, um, can we put that in the form of a motion then? So, um, can I, uh, uh, Member Nickel, can you put that together in a motion? Um, I move to continue the demolition review of one Moffat Road and to continue to conduct the review at the next regular meeting of the commission. Okay. Uh, is there a second for that? I'll second. Okay. All right. Um, do we need a, can we do this on a voice vote or should we take a roll call? You can do a voice vote if you want. What do you recommend, Mr. Uh, Mr. Cole? Um, if, if you think it's a, a divided motion, it you know you can you can take it either way. Okay. Well, since I think it's a divided motion, why don't we take a roll call then? Certainly. Uh, Member Jurch. Aye. Member Minor. Nay. Member Liebold. Nay. Member Nickel. Aye. And Chair Bergman. And I'll say aye. Motion carries. Three to two. Can we ask you to come back next month? Yeah, so can you explain where 
where that puts us and what that does just time from a timing perspective for us. Yeah, so the, the clock keeps ticking. We're still in this 90-day um, review period, so the review didn't end, and um, the commission will have it on their agenda for their next meeting, which um, I know as we get into December, the scheduling changes a bit. I believe that is on uh, Wednesday, December 14th at uh, 7 o'clock. And so we'll come, you'll ask us, we've presented all the information we've had. We've been very transparent. Yes. So we have no new information to present to you. So you'll ask us for things you'd like to see. One of the things I'm going to do is ask the History Museum for the information that they have. Yep. Uh, I understand you went over there and took yep. yeah, took. I've been there uh, and met, met uh, with Kathy to go through what they have, uh, which um, was all presented tonight. Okay. Yeah. And um, so, so just to be clear, I'll, we'll look for for questions from you, so we have something to talk about next Great. next month. Great. Very good. <clears throat> Thank for you. clarity. There are multiple um, Kathys at the museum. I believe you're referring to Kathy O'Hara. <laughs> Kathy O'Hara. Yes. Uh, good to. <laughs> and and then at. Uh, the end of discussion uh, on the 14th, um, at that time you could do the same thing, vote one of three ways, is that right? The, the choices will be the same on the 14th as they are tonight. Okay. We'll, um, we'll have 30 days less on the clock, right? Yeah. Okay. So, All right. Very good. All right. Well, thank you. I want to thank the Aherns for coming this evening. Thank you for being patient with us. And while we've gone through our deliberations here, uh, it, uh, this is such a splendid piece of property. We're so pleased that you're going to, uh, that you've taken it over and, and we're going to do something with it. So this is great. So thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Hello. Okay, so then um, moving down the agenda, uh, we get to the commissioner report. Thank you. So uh, there's only two items that I have uh, for the commissioner's report. That is that uh, it's going to be a busy week for me next week in that um, on the 14th, I am going to meet with the finance committee of the board of trustees on Monday night to um, talk about the financial incentives that we put forward on our ordinance change. Uh, they're still going through a number of the pieces there. Um, and I can explain those in further detail if you'd like. And then on Wednesday, um, I'm going to meet with, and I think Steve Krause is going to come also, we're going to meet with the PCZBA to discuss the changes that we put forward to the ordinance that affect the PCZBA. Um, so we're going to have um, er, er, early in the evening meetings with uh, on both of those subjects. Um, if any or all of you would like to come, you're invited to come Monday night or Wednesday night and um, for a discussion of the changes. Um, there's a great deal of interest in both the financial changes and in the ZBA zoning changes. Great deal of interest uh, and it looks like a lot of positive feedback on most of the issues. The one thing is if you are interested in going and having more than two of you there, make sure you tell Glenn right away because we would then need to notice it up for Open Meetings Act purposes as a meeting of this body as well, a joint meeting. Otherwise, we run into an Open Meetings Act issue. So totally fine to come, just let Glenn know 48 hours in advance. Just point of clarification, isn't there a joint planning meeting on Wednesday as well? Yeah, so these are um, two, two separate um, occasions. So the Finance Committee, um, Mr. Schuster's comment would apply. Okay. Um, the, that joint meeting is it has will be noticed up as a joint workshop at the HPC and PCCBA. Perfect. Okay. 
So but that's I'm certainly... the one that Paul was talking about yes. for Wednesday. Okay. Yes, yes so that's the Wednesday first. meeting. Perfect. I apologize for not being more clear, but yes, on the Finance Committee side, if you want to go just more than 48 hours in advance, tell Glenn, and then it's no problem at all if you're there and, you know, we just need to do the math and then make sure we meet the requirement. <laughs> so so um, the finance meeting talks about uh, the local, local property tax rebate. And so if you landmark your house, there's a, a tax rebate. Uh, the new landmarks uh, will have a 50% rebate on their tax, on their village of Lake Bluff tax, not on the school tax, not on the county tax, but just on the village piece of the tax up to a $2,000 limit for eight years. So you get a little, you get a very nice thank you for the village for landmarking your house. That was one of the discussions I was trying to have with the uh, North Avenue people at our last meeting in the timing of when they landmark their house. So I want to make sure these changes are in place before they go and finally landmark their house so they can take advantage of that. Um, and then there's a further issue about uh, waiving the building fee a building permit fees. Uh, currently, there's a 25% discount for a landmark, and we're asking them to make that a 100% discount. So if you have a landmark house, you don't pay building um, permit fees. And so those are the issues that we'll have in front of the Finance Committee. So if you want to come and talk about some of the, <laughs> the nuts and bolts, the, count the, the dollars business, uh, uh, Monday night's your meeting. Uh, and then the other meeting is the uh, joint workshop meeting to talk about the um, changes that are in front of the ZBA. And some of those are the, uh, it's a change in how we, how the ZBA looks at requests for zoning variances. And this is, um, maybe you can help. This is a bit of a legal nuance of how the ZBA begins its analysis. And the ZBA, when it looks, when it, when it, when they, when a zoning variance is presented to them, they start out with the concept of saying no to the variance, and you've got to prove that you absolutely, absolutely need the variance. If you landmark the house, if they agree to this change and they landmark the <coughs> house, the presumption is not starting at no. The presumption is starting at yes. We want to accommodate saving this property. We want to accommodate making the changes. Yeah, right. and, and, and to be to put it really precisely, the issue is that you have to demonstrate, typically for variation, that you, there's a hardship. Now, it can't be just, wouldn't it be great if I had a second bedroom? Or wouldn't it be great if, you know, I could build this giant thing? You know, it has to be, there's something unique about the property that creates a hardship, and applying the rules strictly under the zoning code, you know, would just, would, would be uh, oppressive. So the idea is it reverses the presumption. Instead of starting off where the burden is on the applicant to walk in and meet that, it would be presumed that if you're landmarked, that your changes, uh, you're starting with a hardship already. Now, if somebody from the public or somebody, you know, wants a neighbor, wants to say, wait a minute, this is a bridge too far. Just because you're a landmark doesn't mean you should be entitled to build into the setback right against my property. They can rebut the presumption, mm -hmm. but, it but it starts off um, in a place that would, should, from a legal perspective, give a benefit to a, an incentive to landmark because when you say, look, I'm gonna keep this house, I'm gonna need to add on to it, but you know, there's a good reason to allow me to do it and we're gonna presume that I, you've met that standard. Mm -hmm. um, so it's just, again, another carrot uh, for landmarking. The other thing I, I heard you say in there was the word precedent. So, so by having this only for landmarked properties, this possibility of um, bending the rules, shall we speak, shall, so to speak, um, then it wouldn't be setting precedent for somebody else who would want to come in with a non-landmark property and do the same thing. Co correct. I mean, it, they, there, there still is, you have to meet the standard. It's just a presumption that you do at the, at the outset. Again, it can be rebutted, but it's the presumption. Right. Right. Um, you know, and it, the other thing, you know, and I'll say is it, it's not making up, I guess, and creating a presumption where one often shouldn't be given. 
I mean, oftentimes with a landmark property, one of the challenges is you have a hardship, which is you're trying to preserve and further the goals of our code. And because the house is already there, you don't want to tear it down. Maybe, you, you, you know, the lock coverage, you know, requirement gets in your way. So you, to, to modernize the home is really difficult to do without tearing down the old portion. So, you know, it furthers the goal, creates the presumption, and definitely makes it easier. One of the challenges that I've seen both here as well as other communities is an applicant comes in and says, you know, I, I want to be able to keep this house, but in order to do it, you know, I, I need to add on and make it more modern and livable. This kitchen just doesn't work in modern day America and so forth. And, you know, it, depending on also who's sitting on the body, you know, that, you know, or a neighbor, it can be hard to over to say, look, this is a true hardship because you say, well, you bought the house, you knew what you were getting into <laughs> and no. So the, it, it, again, it, it creates this incentive and I think puts out a, you know, uh, the clarion call to people say, look, you landmark it, we're not going to be unreasonable. We're going to recognize that you, you know, we want you to keep this and find a path forward to keep, you know, your historic property while allowing you to live in it. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't end up in a demolition. So uh, the, the principal example of that is a house we landmarked uh, two meetings ago which is the 500 North Avenue mm -hmm. house, which is the old camp meeting um, house that mo got moved over to North Avenue. The people there explain that they have these tiny little bedrooms on the second floor mm -hmm. with no closets and no bathroom upstairs. And so they're saying, can you give us a little wiggle room so that we can blow the roof out a little bit further that takes us over the bulk limit, mm -hmm. takes us over the height limit, takes us over the sunlight setback limit but we need an extra four or five hundred feet of room to put in a bathroom up there and some i think it's a, like a master master bedroom closet or something and so do we want to encourage that is are, are we here to, to say we're trying to encourage the old houses in town and so is that house worthy of getting a little wiggle um with regards to perfect compliance with the zoning codes so that's um, the two things we're talking about, both of the committees seem to be quite uh, interested and quite excited about that. Mm -hmm. So um, if you'd like to come to the meetings, um, if we follow the Open Meetings Act rules, uh, we can do that. So that's all I have to say. Um, Mr. Cole, what have you to offer? Yeah, not, uh, not too much to add. I, I suppose I note the, uh, the Finance Committee packet is out there tonight, so if anyone's interested in reviewing the, the text, whether or not you're able to make it in person, you're welcome to do that. Um, you know, what we're really asked to look at the last meeting was comparing, um, you know, this body's recommendations to um, some recently adopted programs in, in Hinsdale, and so we took a deeper dive into that. If anyone's interested in that, especially as it relates to their um, property tax rebate program. Um, aside from that, we're still working on um, some of the public launching outreach work we discussed at our last meeting. Uh, as, as you know, it's been uh, just about two weeks since then, so <laughs> not a whole lot to show at this particular moment. Um, you know, we're trying to get some materials in your hands and out into the public's hands um, probably before the end of the month is the, the target. So stay tuned. Great. Okay. Any other comments? Any contributions, announcements, anything else we want to talk about this evening? I just have one question about the finance meeting. Nothing's changed in our proposal since what we have, since our approval earlier this year, right? So it's just the presentation to the finance board to get their... They're, they're thinking about all the proposals. <sighs> yep, but yeah. the they, actual ask from our committee has not changed, right? The, the ask hasn't changed. Um, I mean, what I would say is this is the third meeting the um, the committee is reviewing this topic, and, and so the ask may be the same. But I think what they're prepared to approve has is you know that is changing. Because it's what what we what they feel we can afford. Um, and and other considerations as well. I mean, for example, um, you know, I I don't believe they will take up the idea of earmarking um, demolition um, tax revenues. Mm -hmm. 
um, they, they thought it was it was not good financial policy in general to earmark revenues for a, a specific purpose, mm-hmm. um, whether or not we can the, the village can afford it. Okay. Is it helpful if more people are there, or do you think, Chairman, you have what you need? <laughs> Always hard to tell with a group <laughs> like that. I don't know the finance committee well enough to know if um, having people there. Um, if it fits your schedule, you know, you're welcome to come. Okay. Um, I don't know that um, there's any specific, you know, speaking role or, you know, testifying role or any part of that that you, you might be undertaking. But it's just a matter of being there and providing information and uh, in many ways explaining the course of the conversations we've had, this board has had for ages and ages yeah. in coming up with these changes. So, um, so. Um, Chairman, I have a question about process then. If if the finance uh, committee would pass it, then it would go to the village board for discussion and they'd have first and second reading. Mm-hmm. That's correct. As a practical matter, we pro- oh, go ahead. Sorry. I'm thinking the fastest timeline of them actually implementing that would then First reading, second reading, discussion, first reading, second reading, that, you know, invariably bumps us into April or something by the time they agree to that or something. But that's just my back of the envelope time guess. So. Okay. You know, as a practical matter, you know, the Finance Committee has three members of the Village Board, but at this point all of them participate in those meetings. Um, you know, there's a draft ordinance that's, um, you know, we prepared at their request, so, you know, they could could move faster than, than that. Okay. I was just thinking about Maple and their application for mm-hmm. time like that. Yeah. Well, they have to keep an eye on that, on how fast they want that to proceed, mm-hmm. uh, knowing that there's a, you know some fairly significant tax benefits there. So I'm hoping that they're going to be able to, to navigate that mm-hmm. and stuff. So, um, okay. Any other comments? Just one question. Do you think that they're going to have to sprinkle this building, this new building? The village code would require that. Yeah. They would require that. Yeah. yeah. Everything gets sprinkled. If you do a major remodel, you get sprinkled. So it's so still the, up in question. On so the people that remodeled the ranch house behind me had to put sprinklers in. So I can't imagine putting sprinklers in a ranch. <laughs> I'll also be burned out before he... <laughs> So, sorry for my smart aleck comment, but, um, <laughs> yeah. So, um, you know more about sprinkler, uh, the application of the sprinkler ordinance than I do, but. Yeah, in short, it's all new construction, and the, when yeah, remodels new are, yeah, yeah, when remodels get to a certain point, an extensive point, I think it's yeah. 75 or 80 um, percent, they'd have to retrofit in sprinklers as well. Um, okay, any other comments, questions? I guess one last point of emphasis. Again, we have, um, you know, we are thin on our ability to um, get a quorum, so as always, communicating um, early if you have to be absent is appreciated so that we can adjust our scheduling accordingly. Yeah, okay, great. Um, so, motion to um, skedaddle? I so move. Okay, second? Second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Anybody object? No, we should have stayed on. But the minutes uh, reflect that it was moved to skedaddle. <laughs> Skedaddling. <laughs> okay. Well, I want to thank everybody for coming tonight. Yeah. Thank you all of you for uh, your questions and um, good comments. And thank you for.